Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, those of you that are here joining us live and also viewing the recording at a later date, appreciate you taking the time to join us today for our live tutorial on lessons learned applying ears with Alistair Mavin. So uh, Mav will join us in just a few minutes. I just wanted to give a quick introduction here on kind of how this came about. And so uh, our live tutorial today, uh, first of all, we do have a chat window available. So uh, we will be taking questions at the end. So if you have any questions for us or for Mav, uh, just type them in at any point during the call and we'll, um, we'll handle those at the end. Um, uh, one at a time, we'll go through those as well. So today on the call, uh, my name is James. I'm with the QRA team uh, on the QB Scribe team here. And uh, on the, doing the presentation today, we have Alistair Mavin. So Mavin is, uh, goes by Mav and he is a requirements uh, consultant and he also does uh, personal coaching and creative thinking exercises with, with different companies. So uh, our relationship with uh, Mav has revolved uh, recently around this definitive guide to ears, which is published on the QB Scribe uh, website, on the QRA website. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, you can uh, find our website or just shoot me an email afterwards and I can make that available uh, to you. So basically, uh, Mav handles uh, the personal uh, coaching and training uh, aspect of requirements engineering, helping people write clear requirements. And on the QRA side, we have a requirements analysis tool and authoring tool called QB Scribe, which helps people um, on larger teams also refine their requirements process and, and adhere to requirements best practices uh, while require writing requirements in less time. So a really quick overview of QB Scribe before we hand things over to Mav. QB Scribe helps teams write clear requirements in less time. It works by uh, improving the overall clarity and consistency of those documents through a series of checks and it runs directly within Microsoft Word and Excel. We also have a enterprise version called QB Scribe for Teams, which uh, puts a server application on your network and allows you to share your licenses and share those analysis configurations with uh, everybody across your company so that you can get everybody on the same page with the types of language that you're using and help refine it in that way. So really quickly, the, the service that QB Scribe offers we have a quality analysis, which is looking at the language that's used in each individual requirement uh, based on standards like the NCOSI guide for writing requirements and others. And then we also look at the document as a whole to make sure that the language that you've chosen to use um, and the requirements themselves, the content is consistent. So you're not repeating yourself or uh, contradicting yourself at other points in the document. So this all revolves around natural language, which you'll hear in the pre presentation with Matt, we believe is the best way to communicate requirements. The problem with natural language is that in that little box where you type in your requirements, you can write whatever it is that you want to say. So EARS helps people to uh, put those requirements in a, in a format that's easier to digest and understand and easier to write. And then QB Scribe makes sure that the language that you choose to use in those boxes when it's uh, structured properly, properly is, um, is as clear as possible. So you're not introducing vague language or, or possible misunderstandings in that way. So, uh, this is what it looks like within Word. You can see you're getting an analysis on the right hand side showing um, a quality score for each requirement that's given and then the words that are potentially problematic are highlighted for you right on the document. Our consistency analysis is finding uh, terms that are used throughout so you can make sure that when you use a particular phrase or word you're using them consistently. That all happens automatically. Uh, same with units. So we can identify units that are found in the document to make sure that those are being used consistently as well. And then lastly, we'll do a similarity analysis, which you can see at the bottom there is comparing two requirements that are uh, similar in the content and allows you to quickly compare them to make sure that you're not contradicting yourself or uh, repeating yourself in your document. So the main focus of today's talk is on EARS, the easy approach to requirement syntax. And uh, this time I'm gonna hand things over to Mav. And uh, we will talk at the end about the QB Scribe integration with EARS where the uh, patterns and templates that Mav talks about uh, can be easily inserted into the document using the integration that we now have with QB Scribe. So at this time, I will turn things over to Mav and uh, take it away. Okay, uh, I'm just taking over the screen. Uh, okay, can everybody see a title page? Uh, can James see a title page? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. We're all good. We yes. can, we can okay. see your screen. Thank you. All okay. right, take it away. Right. Very good. Here we go. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about lessons learned applying ears. Uh, this is principally material taken from a paper <clears throat> that I co-authored with a few people 
uh, that went into the big IEEE requirements conference a couple of years ago. I'll put a reference for that as on a subsequent slide. Uh, so this is essentially a presentation of that paper. So um, what we're going to talk about is why is that not moving? There we are. So an outline of what we're going to talk about. I'll give a brief overview of EARS. Um, I think it's probably fair to assume that most people on this call uh, have some knowledge of EARS, but in case there are some who don't, uh, I'll give a quick overview of EARS. Um, I'll then give a background to the case studies because the paper that I'm mainly presenting uh, involves uh, the work of four different people across several different domains. So I'll explain uh, a bit about the companies and how EARS was deployed in each of the case studies. And then although we set out to uh, learn, um, or at least the paper was initially uh, envisaged to give some lessons learned when applying EARS, we realized that some of the lessons that we learned actually were more generally applicable than that. They either applied to requirements engineering as a whole, to requirement solicitation, to requirements documentation, or to any natural language uh, means of uh, notation. So they're not all just about ears. So we've divided it into general lessons and ear specific lessons. Uh, then there's some references and contact information. And then as James said, we'll have questions towards the end. So um, I, I don't like too many bullet points. So I have the odd picture here and there. Some of them are just gratuitous animals with big ears, but uh, as ears is a thing. Uh, okay, so an overview of ears for those who maybe aren't familiar. So the acronym stands for Easy Approach to Requirements Syntax. It's a notation for authoring natural language requirements, so textual requirements, uh, which as James perhaps implied, it's, it's the way most people write their requirements. It's the language any stakeholder will understand. It's a normal way human beings interact. And therefore, it's the way they usually choose to write requirements. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a place for model-based requirements engineering, model-based systems engineering, and all sorts of particular notations in certain environments and with certain stakeholders are appropriate. In reality, most people write most of the requirements in natural language. So it seems to me intuitively sensible uh, when trying to improve requirements processes to address what most people do, which is writing natural language requirements. So EARS is simple and lightweight um, and it's intuitive because it uses a few keywords in a particular way that is very close to how you would normally use those words. And the key uh, feature, I suppose, of these requirements is that the clauses, the chunks, the uh, parts of a uh, of the sentence of a requirement are always in the same order. And those clauses are denoted by keywords, which uh, in turn tell you what type of requirement it is. Um, and when applying the EARS patterns, the EARS template, you get requirements in one of six basic patterns. The most generic syntax, so this is the way of mapping the uh, basic order of the clauses, if you like, is preconditions come first, then trigger, system name shall, system response. <clears throat> and for those not familiar, this will become more clear in the next few slides. So um, the basic EARS patterns, the first one is called ubiquitous, which is requirements that are always active. So there's no EARS keyword, it's something that the system must do continuously. So the general form is the system name shall, system response. So for example, the mobile phone shall have a mass of less than XX grams. Uh, so high level constraints and, and, and features of the whole system tend to be ubiquitous, for example. Uh, State-driven requirements, these requirements are true, uh, are, 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 sorry, are active as long as the specified states remain true. We're using the keyword while. So while some precondition, or there could be more than one, whilst the stated preconditions are true, the system name shall system response. So, for example, while there is no card in the ATM, the ATM shall display, please insert card to begin. Um, <clears throat> here's an example of something that may be ubiquitous, that you may want the aeroplane to be the right way up all the time. Um, particularly when I use the word that Rolls Royce, I used to use pictures of, of uh, aerospace type things because uh, I had access to a lot of silly aeroplane photos. Uh, Kalula is a low cost South African airline. Uh, and they have a lot of funny liveries on their planes. This is just one of them. And, uh, anyway, I thought it was mildly amusing. Um, so uh, continuing the years patterns, event-driven requirements, uh, they define what the system must do in response to a triggering event. So when some event happens in the world that the system can uh, act, when a trigger, the system name shall system response. So for example, when commanded from the aircraft, the engine control system shall drive back the engine. 
One little feature of EAS that's not explicit in these slides that I'll pick up on now is um, system name should be explicit. So you'll notice in all these examples, it doesn't share, so just say the system shell, or even in this case, the control system, it says the engine control system, because it's specific enough that it will always be obvious which is the target system that is required to do that, uh, to carry out that system response. This is because often requirements are copy pasted into different documents or reused across programs, and it needs to be clear what the system is that's uh, required to exhibit that behavior in the circumstances that initiate that requirement. So optional feature requirements. Uh, this is a simple way to handle product variation or system variation. Uh, so if you've just got a, a basic system and then you have some optional features that, uh, that a system could have, then those requirements would only be applicable if that feature was included. Uh, they're denoted by the keyword where. So where a feature is included, the system name shell system response. So for example, where the car has a sunroof, the car shall have a sunroof control panel on the driver door. Clearly, there'd be no point in having that feature, the, the control panel, if it didn't have a sunroof. So it's only applicable in that circumstance. Uh, this is an in-flight restart. Uh, that's not how they're done now. Um, so the final slide on the basic ears patterns, unwanted behavior. Uh, this is a, a way of handling any unwanted external events that the system has to respond to. Uh, so the keywords are if and then. So if, trigger, then, the system name shall system response. So the example, if an invalid credit card number is entered, then the website shall display, please re-enter credit card details. And although this is a very simple um, notation, or this is a very simple set of words, the if then uh, is, is a very clear sign to the people reading the requirement. This is a mitigation requirement. This, this event is something that you don't really want to happen. So the invalid credit card number being entered is something that ideally wouldn't happen. So you want the system to be able to handle it in some way. You know these things are gonna happen, you're predicting that they will, but you want the system to respond in some way to that unwanted external trigger. And then the final is pattern is basically any combination of the keywords. So while precondition, when trigger, the system name shall system response. You could of course also have a where if there's, a, if there's an optional feature that also has other keywords. So the example here, while the aircraft is on ground, when reverse thrust is commanded, the control engine control system shall enable reverse thrust. So co complex just means more than one ES keyword. <coughs> um, here's a, here's a, an interesting example. Uh, this is, um, I don't know, if you look at it closely, you can see there's a missile flying across the, uh, the deck of the uh, aircraft carrier there, and this guy's running rather quickly. Um, this is uh, the, the real origin of this file, I'm not sure, but the, but the file was called wrong button. Uh, I would actually argue it's not the wrong button, I would say it's a missing precondition. So you could imagine a requirement that says when the pilot presses the fire button, the missile shall fire, or words to that effect, uh, but it should really have a precondition while no weight on the wheels, so, or something like that. So while the aircraft is in the sky, it should do that. You'd think it should be disabled when, when, it's, uh, when it's on the ground. Okay, so uh, as I said, this uh, most of what I'm going to talk about is the lessons learned from, uh, from a group of people who'd all, who all had quite a lot of experience of writing years requirements. So the first one is Rolls-Royce, where I used to work. So myself and uh, one of the co-authors, Phil Wilkinson, uh, this, this part of the case studies um, summed up lessons that he and I learned from using applying years over a period of time. So Rolls-Royce, uh, I'm sure most people will know, are a global engineering company providing integrated power and propulsion in various uh, domains, aerospace, marine, energy, and so on. Uh, employ over 40,000 people in 150 countries. Uh, many projects are geographically dispersed. Many people whose first language isn't in English, uh, but, the first, but all company meetings, all documents are in English. Uh, and how EAS was deployed uh, uh, is, presumably still deployed in Rolls-Royce is through uh, the training is typically part of, or the EARS training is typically part of a half day course called an introduction to requirements engineering uh, done in small groups of 12 to 16. Uh, so the EARS part of that is typically an hour and a half or thereabouts um, and then follow up coaching and support. And Rolls-Royce make things that look a bit like that. 
Um, the next case study was Intel. Uh, so Intel, again, is probably familiar to most people. Uh, they do everything around silicon and so on. Uh, obviously, the whole range from actually manufacturing the, the chips themselves to all the different R&D in, in very diverse technical areas, um, employ over 100,000 in 46 countries. Again, most of their projects are ge geographically dispersed. Um, Sarah Gregory, who's the co-author of this paper I'm talking about from Intel, uh, she said she quite commonly works on projects with like 15 first languages amongst the project partners, uh, and they're all communicating by emails and through documents and so on. Um, and obviously, if their first language is in English, that's a challenge. Um, and interestingly, requirements engineering is, as, as she put it, a distributed function. So there's no, uh, it's, it's the skill set is spread amongst different people, and there's no corporate way of doing things. People aren't expected to follow a particular notation or tool or anything. Um, EARS, um, after, they, after it was first presented at the conference, uh, about 10 years ago, um, a couple of people from Intel took it straight back and immediately started uh, training people there. They've now trained over 10,000 people in using EARS, um, and, uh, and that's part of their one-day training. Uh, but most of the people, again, as implied in the earlier point, most of the people wouldn't call themselves requirements engineers. That's actually also true at Rolls-Royce. Uh, and Intel makes stuff like that. Uh, and the th third example uh, case study was in the nuclear power domain in Finland. Um, you'll be pleased to know that nuclear power in Finland is, is uh, governed by various laws. Uh, these are called YVLs. I, I don't know what that actually means. It's presumably in Finnish anyway. Uh, and these YVL guides um, lay out what the safety requirements are and the means how you're expected to interpret them. Because these guides are neutral, as in uh, they don't specify how you should uh, satisfy them what solution you should use or what notation, what approach, what uh, system you should use. Uh, they're deliberately uh, a little bit vague and that's a bit like many regulations in, in, in most countries, I suppose. Um, and another complication, of course, for them is they also have partners from many different countries, uh, none of whom have English as their first language, which is basically uh, countries, uh, Finland, Russia and, and that that sort of corner of the world, if you like. But, uh, but almost none of them, I, I think. I think you said none of them have English as a first language. So the years and in, in, uh, deployment initially, uh, a researcher who had no experience in, um, in the nuclear power domain uh, used years to reinterpret one of the YVL guides and, and uh, rewrite them in, in years format. Uh, and that was deemed to be successful enough that they then took the whole of the YVL set of guides. And I believe that uh, all, well, I'm not sure about all, um, many current projects in, in uh, Finland in nuclear power are, are using EAS, so I'm told. Uh, and that's a nuclear power plant in Finland. So the lessons learned, as I said, uh, there were four experienced EAS practitioners um, at the time that this paper was written, at that point had six years experience in a range of domains applying EAS. And many insights were gained. As I said, some were more generic in nature, not, if not very ear specific. So things that apply to the whole of requirements engineering, uh, to elicitation or documentation, or more particularly to, um, to natural language requirements specification. Uh, and then there were eight that we felt were more ear specific lessons. So the very general lessons, um, just very briefly go through them because obviously the main focus of this is, is the ears aspect of it. Uh, in general, we all agreed that um, it's worth keeping things simple uh, when delivering training, any sort of notation that you use, any sort of uh, communication you have with a group of stakeholders, assuming they're a cross-section of stakeholders who have a, a range of abilities, if you like, it's best to keep things as simple as possible. If you start introducing um, complicated notations, um, you know, complex tools, then people aren't really interested. Um, you get the most gain from simple steps that help people do things a bit better without much effort. And whilst that applies to ears, it also applies more widely. Um, it's useful to introduce new approaches organically. Uh, for example, the half-day course that I used to teach, that I originally wrote and used to teach for uh, about eight years at Rolls-Royce, um, that um, was, was, um, it was available on the internet. People could find it and book onto it themselves but it was rarely a force on people. It was usually that people self-selected when they felt they needed it. 
um, or you know if colleagues have been on it and recommended it to people so most people were self-selecting uh, and, and went on it out of choice and therefore their ears were open uh, no pun intended um, so they were listening and they were ready to learn um, which which seemed to work because, because people are you know as I say uh, more more likely to take on the messages if it's relevant to them at the time. Um, consistency is an asset uh, and that's definitely something that ears gives you the way the requirements are written they're all more similar in the way they're written even if they're written by different people they're more consistent um, and that consistency makes things easier to review and easier for people to take in. Uh, I could have perhaps put that as an ears, an ears lesson but it also applies more widely I suppose. To be honest it's like the arbitrary what's a general lesson and what's an ears lesson but, um, but I would say that it is a very strong asset of ears that, um, that the requirements are very consistent as I say even if written by different people. I have heard people that say in the past that um, it's boring reading a requirements document written in ears because they all look quite similar. Well, I don't know anyone who's ever read a requirements document for fun. You know, that's not the point. You don't do it for pleasure. What's more important is that each requirement is correct. And that tends to mean they're more consistent. <clears throat> um, another observation that we all, we all made, or at least all agreed with, is that almost always people write iteratively. Um, it's a sort of myth some people think that, you know, if you know your stuff, you can write a requirements document in one go. But very rarely is that true, even for very experienced people, you know, who are subject matter experts and presume, and even if they're also experienced in writing requirements, it's very hard to write requirements first time. Uh, you typically need to write and rewrite. Uh, so accept it. Um, I think you can use requirements notations to introduce other techniques. Um, and again, this is a bit like keep it simple. It's kind of related. Um, I would never, uh, or very rarely, would I say to people, if they were uh, stakeholders who weren't particularly experienced uh, in, in, uh, in abstract thinking, in systems engineering, in requirements engineering techniques and so on, I would, I would never say, oh, we're going to do a, a swim lane diagram and then start drawing swim lanes and, and boxes of a certain shape with arrows with certain arrow heads and using UML notations, for example, not knocking UML in general, just when it's, when it's applied and when it's shown to people. Um, I would tend to do things very gradually. So I would sort of, if I wanted to start using scenarios, I would say to people, oh, can you tell, you, tell me a story about how this system might work? And that's a very intuitive human thing to do. And then maybe when you start recording the story, you'd put it in bullet points, and then you'd start putting each bullet in, in bubbles, and then you start drawing arrows between them. So over a course of a few sessions, you'd start to introduce the, the more rigorous ways of doing scenarios, but you'd do it stealthily. Um, and I think you can do a lot of that with, with uh, requirements in general. Again, ears particularly as well, but, but more generally. <clears throat> um, one thing is, um, when you're trying to write a requirement, sometimes if it's difficult to formulate it into a requirement and you don't know quite how to phrase it, it may be because it's not really a requirement. Um, for example, it could be a goal, a high level goal, objective, aspiration, something that's not really a specific thing that the system must do, it's more a general direction of travel or aspiration, something you'd like to achieve. And my, my sort of silly phrase to help people remember what a goal is compared to a requirement is it's like the Spice Girls say, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. That's a goal, not a requirement. In other cases, perhaps people are trying to write very low level detailed specifications or effectively constraining the solution with the way they're writing requirement. And if that becomes difficult, uh, it's perhaps because you're trying to write too much detail in it and, and you should make it more abstract into a requirement. Um, a question you should always ask when writing a requirement is should a requirement be split? If it becomes too complex and you can't quite work out how to write it, if it's got an or or an implied or in it that, that it, there could be more than one way of achieving this or in both of these circumstances do something, it's a fair chance that it should be split into two different requirements. Um, again, this next one uh, applies generally to requirements engineering, but also I would say particularly with ears, it's very useful when eliciting and documenting requirements to consider wanted behaviour first and then in the second pass go through and consider unwanted behaviour and how you want your system to behave if something unwanted or unexpected happens. If a user does something unexpected or makes an error or if some interacting system does something that you don't want it to, how would you like your system to respond? It just makes it easier to reason about if you do the normal course first and then go back and do the unwanted stuff. 
Um, you can use models to uncover missing requirements. So um, whilst many people write most of the requirements in text, as, as James and I have both said, um, there's nothing wrong with using models in parallel with, require, with, with natural language textual requirements. So for example, if you're writing requirements for um, how to use a, a cash point machine, an ATM, you might have a set of textual requirements, but it would make some sense to consider scenarios and do some linear scenarios as to how, what the system does, what the uh, customer does, what the system does in a, in a linear story. Um, and in doing that, you will check whether you've got coverage of all the requirements that you need. Similarly, if you have some system that's essentially state-based, you might do a state chart and then parse the state chart to see that you've got all the requirements that, that are implied by the, by the model. Uh, again, it depends on, um, on, the, on your audience, what's the most appropriate notation to use. Natural language isn't always the best one to use, which is another point in a minute. But, um, but yes, you, so you can use models or text, uh, and you can use one to cross-check the other, they can cross-validate each other. Uh, the next one, phases of operation. Um, it's worth considering when eliciting and documenting requirements and checking your coverage and completeness of requirements. If you've got requirements for particular modes of operation or phases, like for example, for an aircraft, if you've got uh, you know, pushback and then taxi, take off, climb, cruise, descent, and so on, um, you know, it, it's worth thinking through what phases are relevant. And then for each requirement in one phase, could you need a similar requirement in the other phases? It's just one way of thinking about uh, checking for coverage. I've already touched on the last one. Natural language is not always the best, the best notation. Whilst most requirements are written in natural language, um, I don't see any reason why within a document, if you've got 95% of your requirements written in text, that the other 5% are consciously not written in text because they may not be inherently textual in nature. It might not be the most logical way of doing it. For example, if you have a mathematical formula or if you have something that's inherently graphical in nature, there's no point in putting that in text. You could, but if you try to put maths into, into English language, you've got to be very careful about where your commas are and where words wrap around lines because the implications of, of grammar can be huge in maths. So if you want something very precise that's mathematical, write it in maths. Um, if you want something that's, that's non-textual, do it in whatever's the most appropriate notation. Okay, and then on to perhaps the meat of the, of the uh, proceedings, if you like, uh, the ear specific lessons learned. So first of all, uh, again, I've flagged this as an ears lesson, but you could say this applies to most things. Um, all, of the, all of the people involved in these case studies agreed that the training should be short. It's usually part of um, a, a half day's training or a full day's training. Um, the training that I now offer is in a half or full day as well, and that's dedicated to, to ears. There's a little bit of general requirements engineering, but it's mainly about using ears. Um, and essentially, the morning of both those courses is the same, uh, which is, you might say, theory and classroom exercises on ears. And the afternoon, if you do the full day, is practicing writing your own requirements from your own domain. So the delegates bring requirements from their own uh, current projects or past projects or certainly their own work if they want to uh, and then they work on their real requirements with support so they they leave with uh, a good working knowledge of doing requirements in ears in their own domain and that's proved to be uh, very effective um, you can even get training in even less time than that i have trained people in an hour um, if there are people who are already you know quite knowledgeable about requirements engineering you can train people in about an hour, but obviously they tend to need a little bit more support after that. But you certainly don't need a week's training. <clears throat> um, you can use um, ears with or without a tool. So um, ears as, a, as a, uh, an approach to writing requirements, as I said at the start, it's about having the clauses always in the same order. You can do that in Word, you can do it in Excel, you can do it in DAWs, because although doors and other tools um, are good at managing certain aspects of requirements. In effect, the requirement is a string. It's just a set of words in an order which you can determine, uh, as is Word, Excel, and, and many tools, in fact. Um, so you can write an ears requirement in any of those because an ears requirement is a string of words. The added value of an ears requirement is, it, is that it's a set of strings in a particular order with keywords, which adds 
enough rigor that it's that it's significantly more precise than just pure natural language. So you can do it in, in any of those applications. You can do it on the back of a cigarette packet or pen and paper. Um, and one of the reasons why I think it's useful, uh, or this is a, a, a good feature of EARS, is that many people, practitioners, stakeholders, are very reluctant to take on new notations and particularly new tools. When I say tools there, I mean specialist tools that, that are for particular notations like, um, probably shouldn't mention, but where you have to have, um, you have to have training in a particular tool and you need to use that tool in order to use a notation. Um, and where you need training in a tool, um, then, and, and buying licenses, that tends to put people off and it's, it, it's, uh, it makes uptake of tools uh, can make it very slow. Having said you can do it with or without a tool, there are obviously some advantages in tools and a lot of the things James said about QV Scribe offer very useful features and he's going to show some uh, a demo of what QV Scribe will do for you in general and year specific uh, at the end of this presentation. So um, the next year specific lesson is that coaching is very useful to embed the learning. This guy in the photograph here is Yogi Berra, who was, as you can probably guess, a baseball player. Uh, and he's uh, famous for very strange quotes, which many of which are quite amusing. The one I like, particularly like is he said, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. Um, and I, I like that because I think it's funny, uh, but also it does apply uh, to, to things like requirements engineering and writing requirements particularly because it kind of seems like it ought to be easy. Uh, and when you look at um, notations or textbooks or you get a class, you kind of think, oh, that sounds all right, that sounds easy. But then when you actually come to do it in your domain, it can be a little bit harder. And so although ears is very easy to learn and pick up and you, get a, you do get a good return quite quickly, to master it does take a little bit longer. Um, to another, another quote is, uh, this I believe is a, an Italian proverb, is making wine is simple, but not easy. Uh, so I think there it, it's like an ears requirement, a well-written ears requirement is very easy to understand and very simple. And you kind of think, oh, that's so easy, I could have written it. But getting to that point of, of doing, writing a very simple, clear requirement is not necessarily very easy to do, or at least it takes a bit of practice. So practically, what does coaching mean? Um, usually what I do, and when I do training, I offer this as a, as a part of the training, is that I, I, I invite people to send me a few emails afterwards, uh, and I say, write 10 requirements, and I mean 10, not 20 or 50, and they write 10 requirements and send them to me, and I review them and make suggestions, and then they write another 10. And usually if you do two or three iterations like that, you'll, you get over the initial errors that you might make. And that way, when you write 200 or 500 or 6,000 requirements, you're not making the same systematic error over and over again that takes a lot of fixing. Uh, so a little bit of coaching, it does make quite a lot of difference. <clears throat> I have to admit, I couldn't find an entirely appropriate picture for every one of these. Lessons. Some of them are thrown in there, which is a picture of an ear that doesn't have much bearing on that. Uh, on that lesson. So the lesson is challenge the ears pattern. Um, so even when you have some experience in writing in with ears, it's always worked. So your first draft, I talked about how um, you tend to write ears uh, requirements iteratively. One thing people find is that with ears, their first draft requirement is closer to the, the final requirement. Um, so they by as soon as you see something that you need to write a requirement for, you'll think, oh, what type, what ears type is that? So your first draft is likely to be an ears-like requirement, even if it's quite drafty, uh, but you should always question that. So particularly ubiquitous requirements, if you're saying the system will always do this thing, you might think, well, actually, is that actually always true, or is it only in certain states? Um, and then if it's in a particular state, is the one that would mirror it for different states? If you have um, a requirement that is event-driven, when something, the system shall do something, is there a missing precondition? Should it be while something's true, when something's happened? So you should always challenge the pattern, even if you write them yourself. And if you're reviewing other people, you should challenge the pattern to say, is that really the case? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another of the lessons is, are the ears clauses necessary and sufficient? So the clauses being, um, the, the uh, optional feature, if it's there, 
the preconditions for estate driven and the event for event driven or the unwanted event for an unwanted behavior um, are they necessary and sufficient so again it's a bit like the last one um, if you've got a requirement is there something missing is there a precondition missing if you've got a precondition might there be two preconditions that both need to be true um, if you've got a precondition does it also need a trigger so some precondition might be true but the system isn't actually required to do something until a particular trigger happens. So you need to think, is it really true always that this is needed as I've written it? Do I need to add something? Do I need to take something away? Non-functional requirements. Um, this picture's, uh, I, I, I like it because um, on some of the London Underground lines, uh, they have door buttons on the trains to, to open the doors, or do they? Uh, and the, door, the buttons actually have no wires behind them at all. They do nothing. They have a bit of resistive feedback, so it feels like you're pressing a button, but it actually doesn't do anything. What happens is that the driver presses a button and opens all the doors, but users like to feel that they're in control. That's what I think is a non-functional requirement. Um, anyway, non-functional requirements is a, is a strange term. It's a perennial thing in, in the requirements what is a non-functional requirement. People argue about how to classify them, what they are. Most people agree that the term non-functional requirement is very odd because you're defining something by the fact that it isn't functional, which is quite odd. Um, anyway, most of the year's papers don't explicitly talk about non-functional requirements as such. Most of them have some non-functional requirements as examples, but we've never really addressed non-functionals explicitly. Um, which perhaps we could have done. Um, we are, it's one of the things I'm going to do very soon um, is to integrate a more specific part about non-functional requirements in my training so people understand how to handle non-functionals in here. But in the paper that I'm mainly presenting here, there are, uh, there are examples of non-functionals and we talk about how ears can be used for that. For example, uh, constraints are typically ubiquitous uh, things like physical, uh, you know, size and, and weight and so on, and capacity requirements tend also to be ubiquitous. Um, and, and then basically you can use pretty much all the ES patterns to define non-functional requirements in various ways, which again are in, are in various papers. Um, <clears throat> safety and reliability requirements, <coughs> again, are, uh, can be handled quite easily in ES. For example, things like mean time between failure, um, they're typically um, ubiquitous state driven. And then things like functional safety requirements have been written using all the years patterns, except probably the optimal features. Uh, but, but there's no reason why you can't do safety and reliability. And don't forget, EARS was born in a safety critical environment. Um, the, 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 the final lesson uh, of, the, of the eight that were in the paper is that um, EARS helps authors of all abilities. So I said earlier that um, requirements are written iteratively, but people tend to write their first draft requirement tends to be better uh, if, once they know EARS, whether they're novice or whether they're experienced. Uh, novices tend to get better at writing requirements quicker when they know EARS than when they don't. Um, and, the, and the consistency uh, that you get from everybody using the same notation that's quite easy to pick up is of great value. But equally, experienced authors often find it very useful as well. I've had a lot of experienced people, some of whom have got more experience than me in writing requirements. When they know, when they find out about ears, they go back and revisit old sets of requirements and rewrite them using ears. Um, and the other thing that's, that's not an explicit les lesson in this, uh, in this paper that, I, that I'm reporting from, uh, but it's, it's definitely it's mentioned is that um, ears is particularly useful for people whose first language is not English. That has been touched on. But. And then perhaps the plus one, uh, the one I'm going to add that isn't in the paper, um, is that um, is that ears, all the papers that I've written so far on ears tend to talk about ears as a syntax. And I think most people think of ears as a syntax, a, a structure of how to write requirements. But in a way, it's rather more than that. It's kind of a philosophy, it's an outlook, it's, a, it's an approach to writing requirements. Um, and in order to write requirements using EARS, you need to know quite a lot about the domain of the system that you're writing and, and its interfaces and so on. So for example, you would need to understand the scope, you need to understand who the actors are, what the actions are, what the conditions are, 
what the modes are and so on. And as uh, someone from a large blue chip company who's a user of ears said to me, he said, if you can't write it in ears, you don't understand it. So I have had people say, oh, it's difficult to write requirements in, it, requirements in ears. And then when you interrogate them, it's because they actually don't really know what they want the system to do, or they don't know which uh, users are going to be able to do a certain thing with the system, i.e. they haven't thought enough. And in a way, the, uh, the syntax forces people, or you might say encourages people, I would perhaps argue, forces people to do that thinking and find out, do the hard thinking that they need to do in order to be able to write a requirement. And perhaps it's, it's the fact that the syntax takes care of itself. So, and that allows you to spend most of your effort thinking about the meaning and what the requirement actually has to do, what the system has to do, rather than the shape of the requirement itself, because ears gives you that. So anything to do with ears can't really go by without Spock, and Spock would probably say that you'd often be able to be logical. Uh, so here's a subset of all the references. Um, so the original ears paper is, uh, is the top one, and the follow on big ears was basically just a bigger, um, a bigger uh, subset, of, a bigger set of case studies that we did with more different requirements documents. Uh, listen, use ears. The one from IEEE Software is is if you want a very very quick overview, is very short and easy to read. Uh, listen's learned uh, the that one I've highlighted, that's the one that I'm basically reporting on today. Uh, and then in the current IEEE software, there's, I was asked to do um, 10 years of years, so it's a sort of reflection on the last 10 years of years. Uh, so that's in the current IEEE software. <clears throat> and I perhaps should mention as well that the original years paper, the top one on that list, uh, has actually, I just found out recently, um, has been uh, awarded the most influential industry paper from RE 2009, which they award in 2019. Uh, and RE 2019 is currently going on in South Korea. So on Thursday, very early in the morning, my time, I'm actually presenting uh, via the internet uh, on a, a WebEx thing, a bit like this, uh, to accept the award for it being the most influential paper. Um, so uh, contact me for training, coaching, and consulting in EARS, uh, general requirements engineering and creativity techniques. Uh, there's my URL and my email address, and at the bottom is ResearchGate, which is where you can find all of my papers. Uh, so that's me finished, and um, over to James, I believe, who will be leading the questions. Yeah, we do have a couple for you right away, Mav, if you want to stay on board here uh, yep. for this part. Uh, the first question was asking about whether uh, EARS could be applicable for stakeholder, user, or customer requirements. Um, at that stage, is there a way to implement ears for those types of requirements? Uh, well, to some extent, it depends what people mean by stakeholder requirements. Um, if they're very high level things and people are kind of saying um, the user needs to be able to do something and it's completely independent of the system, uh, then they're close to being goals in the language I like to use. Um, and the short answer would be, I wouldn't probably write those in ears. However, what I would say is the general concept of ears, which is use a small set of words, keywords in a particular way, define what that means and use them consistently and use segmented statements in clauses always in the same order. Those principles certainly could be applied. Okay, and that led to another question from uh, uh, the same person that asked, they had attended a tutorial of yours in the UK a few years ago where okay. you had talked about ears plus. And yep. we're wondering if you could just quickly explain the differences between when to use ears versus ears plus. Okay, so ears plus is uh, not published as such. I have presented it at various conferences, but there isn't a reference that people can go to. Um, but ears plus in very simple terms, it unpacks the basic clauses of an ears requirement into sub clauses. So for example, uh, the, the system response, instead of just being a string, it might say that the system shall um, drive some parameter towards some value with a comparator until it hits some limit. So you know, push some speed up to it reaches a certain value. Or something. So it's a way of chunking up the requirement into more precise little parts. Um, and the value of ES plus is that you can be more precise in your requirements, um, but they still look like natural language. I mean, the thing about ears is that although it's got some rigor behind it, you don't need to have 
you don't even need to know what ears is to be able to read a requirements a requirement written in ears because it's natural language ears plus adds another level of rigor still and yet the resulting requirement still looks like natural language so you can do more analysis in the background with it without those people reading reviewing uh, or whatever the requirements without them having to know that it's a, a more rigorous requirement if you like without them having to understand what that notation is okay great uh, so that was it for the questions we have so far. Uh, we will have uh, questions open at the end as well. So if you have any more questions for myself or for Mav, go ahead and type those in the comments box. Uh, I'm just going to dive in and show you the ears integration with QB Scribe right now. So I'll switch the uh, display over here. Now, uh, some of the points that uh, Mav had mentioned, the general tips for requirement writing um, are problems that we were uh, looking to tackle as well when we created QB Scribe. Uh, for example, making them uh, simple and consistent, uh, whether it should be split into multiple requirements. And we found that along with using um, the ears method, it, you can also improve your requirements by um, looking for kind of keywords or, or indicators that there might be problems with the requirements themselves. So a quote that I like to mention along those lines is from Alan Greenspan, uh, the now somewhat infamous American economist that, uh, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. And that is uh, a problem with requirement writing, like Mav had mentioned, that the, the main focus of writing, writing a requirements document should be to make sure that it's clearly understood. It's not for entertainment value or for uh, being creative or original in how you write, but just by natural, um, our, the natural way that we approach writing and the way that we've been trained to and the way we were taught to our whole lives, we, we want to kind of liven it up a little bit and want to make it interesting. And there's all these words that we use that sometimes just add extra words to the requirement, but actually make it harder to read and sometimes can actually lead people down the wrong path. So with QB Scribe, we developed a way to uh, take the rules for requirement writing, uh, like some of the ones that Mav mentioned, others that we found um, through the INCOSI guide for writing requirements and different resources like that. And look for those clues that are present in requirements. Okay, how do I know if I'm trying to say too much in a requirement? So one way is that you have multiple imperative statements. So if you're saying two things that must happen or shall happen, that's an indicator. Uh, if you're using too many uh, continuances, so words like and and or more than a couple of times in that phrase, that can be an indicator that maybe you are talking about multiple ideas and you're not getting it quite uh, granular enough. And then the actual language that you choose to use by, you know, if you're writing a specification, it can be easy to say that the user interface shall be easy to understand or easy to use or user friendly and words like that. And when we started compiling these lists of how many words there actually are included in this list of uh, kind of the no fly zone words that you shouldn't be using in a requirement spec, we found that there were well over 100. The current list has between 100 and 150 words. And so we started classifying those in different categories. and QB Scribe basically just brings those to the attention of the reader. So when you want to start using uh, ears along with QB Scribe, we actually developed an integration and this is great for uh, existing users that use the ears method. Um, once you've really mastered it, it might be easier for you to just type it out uh, yourself. But this is integrated within QB Scribe for Teams. So if you are getting a large number of people involved in writing, um, with ears, then this is a way to help everybody make sure that they're using the right language uh, for that method as well. So um, here's how it works. This is a, a active Word document that's open. You'll see I have the place requirement template button here. And then the patterns that Mav had mentioned are listed here. So if I wanted to write a state driven, driven requirement, I click state driven, it automatically puts in the while so that we know it's state driven. <clears throat> and then um, I can type in uh, the requirement here. So the precondition might be, uh, we'll use a garage door example, which we've used before. Uh, so when the garage door is open, so that's the precondition, then I go over to the system. So in this case, it is uh, the garage door <coughs> opener system that we're talking about. So again, naming explicitly what system is responsible for that. The imperative that we're using here, this is required. So we're going to use the word shall, and then we can add uh, open the door, open the garage door would be more specific. So the template just allows you to write using the ears method and not um, have to worry about which, which word you're using and it can allow teams to get on the same page with writing those. So all those templates are available, except now once I've written that requirement, the analysis is automatically available in QB Scribe. So this is the marking stage here. So if I click analyze, 
that's going to run those three types of analysis that we talked about before. So it's looking at the quality. So that's the language that's used in each requirement statement. And then also looking at the consistency and similarity. So when I go to view analysis, now that report that I just written, uh, that I just wrote is at the bottom and the individual uh, parts of that ears template are now highlighted. So the precondition is the garage door is open, the system is um, the garage door uh, opener system, and then the imperative shell and the system response open the garage door. And we can see that this was given a score of five out of five. So uh, what might that look like if we had a poorly written requirement? Well, I can sort this according to issue. So for example, if I had a requirement that was written that contained uh, multiple imperatives. There were a number in this particular document that had that. So if you're working with a document that maybe wasn't written in ears and you're converting it over or you have uh, legacy documents that exist before you started using ears, you can use QVScribe to clean up the language. So this will show if you're using um, these multiple imperatives within the same requirement, that's a sign that this should be broken up into multiple requirements. Also, if an imperative statement is missing or if you're using vague language, uh, these types of things are all highlighted for you within QVScribe. The results are displayed to you directly on your document so you can make the changes to it on the spot. And you'll see here that I can hover over the word that causes the problem and it will actually give me um, feedback with what I should do with that. So for here we're saying fallback is terminated immediately. And here it's saying replace with specific timing constraints. So at, depending what level of requirement you're writing, so for a functional requirement, you would actually just remove that word um, immediately. When you're getting into their test cases and, and talking about non-functional requirements, you could get into saying um, how quickly that needs to be done, but asking a system to do something immediately um, is not clear. So it can be difficult to keep all of these different words in mind and when you should use them and which words are okay and which ones aren't. So QVScribe allows you to save different configurations of these lists so that you can quickly get, um, get everybody on the, on the same page with the language that you're using. So that's the quality analysis. We talked also about the consistency with terms and units. And then similarity will allow you to make sure that, um, like Matt had mentioned, that you have um, each requirement is stating explicitly why, when and why, um, or when and where that requirement is applicable. So for example, if I put the threshold here up to 100% and similarity, this will show me that this document has two requirements that are exactly the same. I can click on it and see them in context here. And I see that one is talking about when this particular system is in the power on reset state. If I click on the other one, it'll show me in context that it's actually talking about the pace now state up above here. So they should actually be pointing out um, in these requirements that this is a state driven requirement. So if these were to be written in ears, you'd avoid this problem and actually have uh, it clearly indicated in which state this uh, ventricular sensitivity would be applicable. So that's how ears can be used with QVScribe and then QVScribe can be then used for your requirements that are written in ears to make sure that kind of the typical pitfalls that people fall into of, of using vague language is, uh, is caught uh, automatically. So that's one way that you can help your entire team improve the quality of the requirements that you're writing and again keep everybody on the same page. So we did have uh, another question that came in and we'll get to the other questions here in a moment but we were asked uh, about the integration specifically with Word and Excel and um, somebody asked are there integrations planned for other requirements management tools specifically DOORS NG. Uh, there is an integration that's currently in development for DOORS NG right now. Um, we have a, a working prototype of it and we're working to kind of flesh out the details of that, but we're expecting uh, the new version of QVScribe. This is version two right now. QVScribe three will be launching later this year and that will include integrations originally with DOORS is what we're looking to do first and then other uh, management tools as well, such as JAMA and um, uh, Perforce Helix and other tools will be added um, in time. So. Currently, it exists within Word and Excel. We do work with DOORS through a, a CSV workflow. So you can actually, if you've written requirements in Word and you need to get them into DOORS, we do have this export feature uh, where you can export them in a format that's made specifically for DOORS uh, so that it's easy to upload those. And then for requirements that are currently existing, uh, already stored in DOORS, uh, you can analyze them in QVScribe for Excel using a uh, CSV round trip. So to answer your question, uh, currently, it's only within Word and Excel, but those other integrations are coming soon. So we'll jump over just to see if there are any uh, other questions here. And if you well, do have well, any others, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, while, while you're looking at that, I just had a, a comment on the part of the demo you did where you were talking about 
the the requirement that you wrote obviously very quickly in a demo, um, and it and it scored green that it was it was correct. Now I just want a word of caution that people using QVScribe that shows that it is syntactically correct. It obeys the rules of ears, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's correct in terms of that it's semantically what is needed. So you know it it, it it's it's a check of of syntax but it still needs a human being to decide, is it actually correct? It's absolutely yeah. useful, but you should be clear that it doesn't, it doesn't say it's 100% correct. And just a little word of caution. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that um, the current version, well, the way QVScribe works is we have uh, feedback being given to the user, so it's not changing the document um, in itself. And the purpose is to find these most common requirements errors. So. Uh, using the wrong language, calling items by different names, ending up with um, two very similar requirements that might be contradicting each other, might be repeating themselves unnecessarily, bringing those to the attention of the users. And it's very similar to what you had mentioned earlier, Map, where we do want to have uh, the time that's spent reviewing the documents to be focused on that content. So making sure that the behavior that you're describing is the behavior that you want. This is how you want the system to respond and that you've covered your bases in terms of what uh, potential scenarios could come about, uh, but definitely the, the quality scoring is based on the language that's being used to make sure that um, to make sure that you're you're not being unnecessarily vague or uh, or contradictory in, in what you've written. So that's a, a great point. And we do have again the uh, definitive guide to ears is available on the QRA website. Uh, you can go there; it's right uh, at the top of the resources page. And I'm just going to check now if there are any questions. I see a few have come in. And so we do have a question with the release schedule for version three. We're looking through um, towards the end of this year is when we expect that to be ready. So either uh, early 2020 or late 2019, we expect that new version to be launched. And we have another question here. Um, is there any chance of QVScribe working with other languages than English in the future? Um, it's definitely something that we're op open to at this time. Uh, it is currently only available in English. And we'll just give a moment to see if there are any other questions here. And we'll just see. Uh, Mav, did you have any other closing thoughts? Um, no, not really. Well, it, it's, it's one of the, it's a, it's a criticism with a small c of something you said. Um, you talked about requirements that have uh, ands and ors in them. Um, I think basically a requirement, a, a mature requirement that is it, that is finished, I, I believe should never have the word or in it. Mm. If, it's a, if it's a draft requirement that's going to be worked on and you might say in these circumstances you want the system to do A or B and you're not sure yet, so long as it's marked as draft and you're going to work it out, that's fine. But as, once a requirement is absolutely finished, in my mind, it should never include the word or. Because if it's got two different sets of conditions, if this or this, then do something, I would just write two requirements, one for each. And if the response is to do something or something else, I think that means you haven't really understood what needs to happen. And in certain circumstances, you'll definitely want one response. And in other circumstances, you'll definitely want another response. So I would just say that in my view, or is a very bad word in a requirement. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point. So the, um, within the tool as well, so I had mentioned or and and being under this category of uh, continuances. So a sign that if you use, you know, this language, you know, saying this, it shall do this and, 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 that's an indicator that maybe you're trying to say too much. Um, for example, with what you're looking for, um, where are we superfluous? Uh, we were... Uh, under continuances here. So these are the words that are included on that list by default. So you'll see or a little bit zoomed in here, but um, saying things like and or else otherwise and or especially will be flagged. Um, if you wanted to ensure that the word or was never used, say at this particular level, you could actually remove it from this list of uh, continuances and actually add this to the list of vague words. And by doing it that way, by adding the word or here, this will actually bring to the attention of the reader any time that the word or is used. So at different levels of your requirement writing, you can add that level of control so that you're actually seeing um, in case that slipped in at some point, if somebody's used that word, then you can be, be notified and have the score affected by the use of, of that particular word. So thank you for that. 
All right. So I don't see any other questions coming in here. So, and we are at the end of our time right on the nose. So once again, I just want to thank you, Mav, for taking the time today and thank you for everyone who joined. Um, and if there are any other questions, you can feel free to email. I uh, get the email addresses back up here. At the bottom, you can email me directly. Uh, whoops, went to the wrong one. There we go. Uh, email me directly, james.carr at qracorp.com. And then uh, Mav's email is there as well, mav at alistairmavin.com. And you can head to alistairmavin.com for uh, his booking schedule and other resources if you'd like to get in contact with him directly. So again, appreciate you taking the time and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. All right, take care.